everybody doing today? Welcome to, oh my goodness, I'm not dressed for the occasion. Let me just put on my talisman, my good luck charm, my crown of roses. There we go. Now we're ready, baby. Now, and in fact, I don't even have my, my, uh, I don't even have my scapular on yet. This one is for the Catholic bros. There we go. Now we're ready. YouTube's probably going to chart, uh, ding this off. I'd like to thank, uh, Roland Bones for opening for me. He's the opening act, and we're going to close the night out with a bunch of Traveler. He spent the whole time talking about a game that I have absolutely no interest in. Uh, Matthew Colville is engaged in an entirely different hobby than I am. Today is April the 9th, 2024, and we're playing some more Traveler. Now, because we're doing Traveler in one-to-one -one time, I've got two major adventuring parties, I guess you could call them, and they're both tied up. Our scout is tied up. He is running guns right now. He's already landed on... Uh, what is the system he's on? He's on Bradwalk right now, and he's delivering ammo to an incipient rebellion. Uh, shipped, I believe, for the Acid Queen. Uh, Penfold, your live stream is up against one of the all-time great live streams. Which one is that, Penfold? I don't even know. I just do this catch-as-catch-can. Normally, I like to do it at, uh, you know, crazy hours at night, but I wanted to go a little bit early. It's 10.30 on the East Coast U.S., so they have an opportunity to jump in and, and play along with us live instead of tuning in during their morning commute or during the shower. Let's see. Good, good morning, Helldivers. Welcome to Space Vietnam. So, what that means today is we're going to be doing a little couple of more systems. We're going to talk a little bit about the one of the major inspirations for Traveler, a little little series called, um, which actually coined the term Traveler uh, by E.C. Tubb, and particularly the book, the first book in the series, The Winds of Gath. And I think that might shine a little bit of light on where some of these ideas come from. And how they were implemented. Yeah, Doom Arrest of Terra, the mythical planet, which most people don't even believe exists, but it does. And I gotta be honest with you, when we finally got there, I was kind of disappointed because EC Tub went back to a well that he'd already been to twice. Um, so, bit, bit of a tease, bit of a letdown, you know. But with all that said, um, I, I will say this our, our money crater, Chad Solo, Yesterday is the day that they misjumped, and today is the day that they are arriving in Tardmart, speaking of stupid names for a planet, and uh, making their delivery and kind of, kind of adjusting their plans. I think by the end of today's episode, we'll have a much better idea what the eventual route for the money creator will be in this segment of the Penfold subsector. Uh, but, but and so let me just go ahead and turn the camera around and show you the goods. You're not here to look at my wonky, weird, mismatched face. The, the the eye color is not from the lighting people, but we're making progress on that. I've been rattling the insurance company's cages, and we're making motion. So there you go. There's our there's our little hotel room walls. And I did. Oh man, I sat down and I did some really good stuff. First of all, let me just. Give you guys motion sickness. I was so enamored of this. I, I made a meme. Who calculated these jump coordinates, pilot? I believe you did, sir. Well, uh, now's not the time for the blame game. Just get us to Tardmart. You know, I think I might just miss my my mismatched eyes once I finally get them corrected. Uh, yeah, you know, I like to think it gives me a little bit of uh, you know humility. It's that little bit of of imperf imperfections that keeps me from getting too big-headed. So here you go. I know this isn't the greatest. Let me turn that light back on. Oh, there. oh man, that looks so much better. Okay, so it, it's, it may be a little, little bit hard to read, but the first thing I want to do today is take a look here at... The, so I, I sat down and I realized these systems are all like captive systems. Well, they must be captivated by Hank Hillsong, and the cult of the Dagonians. So I thought, all right, well, this is, makes this a polity, except the two systems we're going to look at today are Semet and Calditus. And if Calditus isn't a planet full of rednecks, I'm going to be a little bit disappointed. The red outline demarcates those systems that are fully under the thumb of the Tard Martians. 
I, you'll notice I didn't close it off because we need to see if Semit and Calditas, does it make sense for these guys to be part of the greater co-prosperity sphere? And of course, the Hank Hill song is trying to expand his reach down here into Corvinus. We know that they have a presence, a, a small but growing presence down there. The to planet Tobor, remember Vegas 762, see the pale blue, we got another little polity. This is the prison planet that all of the undesirables from the overpopulated planet of Tobor get sent to. But you can, you know, you've got land, lots of land neath the starry skies above. And then Shauner here is one of those poor little planets that I thought, you know what, they must be under the wing of the Toborians. Oh, this is a hereditary monarchy that is installed by and protected by the AI boss of Tobor. And then, of course, up here we've got this other polity, the, the Janov 36ians that are effectively controlled by the, um, the, the, the mercenary band, the, the VLC, the V, it's not the VLC, that's a, that's a terrible video app, isn't it? Um, the, the Veet, is it the Veet or is it the Velt? Let's take a look. Def oh, VDC. It's the, it's the Voight Defense Corporation. That's what it is. Yeah. So the Voight Defense Corporation effectively runs the show all over here. Although we do know that Intania... Oh, Intania. That's right. Intania is the system that for some reason has water at the surface. And I believe it has no atmosphere. But it does have a B-class starport. And they're planning... Oh, yeah. This is where the VDC is, is located. And I think, if I recall correctly, that the queen, the acid queen of Blaine's world shipped, shipped guns down here to try and prevent that from happening. I'm not going to worry about that today. Like I said, the two big things I want to do. But I also, see the black hexes, that's where there are no planetary systems. So what I want to do first, and, and I don't think, maybe if we have time, we'll take a look at these. But I want to know, see where it says red? I want to kind of connect these two polities a little bit more. I want to see if there's like a headquarters down here that might result in Hanky and Chambers and and maybe even Cedar Heath. Although Cedar Heath only has a couple of hundred guys making bespoke vacuum suits. I'd like to know if there's any larger connection here. And then likewise, let's just go ahead and rather than just have this one little tenuous connection, let's see if there's some planets. So I'm going to roll 4d6 and remember, there are planets present when you roll that on a four, five, six, the world is present and the color of the die it will match with the color of the, the, the written in each hex. So fours, fives, and sixes. So we got three more systems. Call me Mr. Blue has nothing. So we will use the good eraser. Where's my good eraser? Where you at, boy? You're hiding out on me. There she blows. All right, so blue is going to be nothing. And then I have three more systems that I can populate over here, which gives us a little bit more time to kill. I'm tempted to go ahead and just finish off this whole sector without you guys so that we can focus more on the adventures. But where would be the fun in that? You guys are really smart, and you're just as good at me and even better at giving me things. I would never have come up with Hank Hillsong. Uh, but, but I would never have come up with Red Blobster. I think that's just absolutely delightful. But for today, I don't really care about these three systems. I'm just happy they're there. I think we'll continue with our, our standard operating procedure where we go ahead and roll for spaceports. At this point, we just care about, we just care about, you know, is there gas? Do we have a little go juice? Can we move between systems or not? And to know that, we have to roll up the starports, and we're looking for low numbers here. And once again, it's going to be red, white, and black for those. So red comes up with a five. That's going to be a B-class starport right here. Black is a ten, is an eight, and that's a C-class, and ten is an E-class. So this is C, and here we have another E-class ticket. There isn't even an orbital station there. That is going to be just a, a hole in the ground down on the planet side. We will name this planet Stag Brew, but I gotta be honest with you. We got a lot of, look at this, we, we got 
Brad Walk, Hark Wind. Um, where's the other one? There's a couple more in here. Uh, ba Cedar Heath. We got a whole lot of true scorn. We got a whole lot of word words. It's starting to it's starting to feel a little bit like a 40k universe, isn't it? The other thing we can do is check for starlings. And for that, we have to roll some dice. Remember, uh, a jump one to jump one. So we, I'm going to do my B's to stuff first. B to C, B to C is uh, jump ones. And B to C's, both of these. So the B to B, there is a jump lane on a result of... Oh, is it... What, wait. If there is... Oh, I always get this right. For its jump, if if you've got... Here we go. So, so here's our table. Jump one. So from B... To C, you, you've got a jump lane on a two or more. So I have to roll once. We have one, and then twice. We do not. So the Miner's Union over here in Go Way is also connected to Stag Brew. But Stag Brew is not connected to Chambers. I'm not going to roll to see if there's a Starling jump to there. Instead, I'm going to check down here. This is a jump to from B to C. A jump two from B to C, there's only a lane on a four or better. So wouldn't you know it? There is. So we've got some interesting Cedar Heath. Is not a big system, but boy, howdy, is it a real node. We've got from B to B across two, we need a three or better. And I get a one, so there's no lane there. And then from B to C across two, once again, I need a four or better. So Stag Brew is also connected over here to Semit. And I think that's pretty good. B to B on a jump three, one, two, three, occurs on a four or better. So Stag Brew will have a nice little jump lane over here. And I guess it makes sense when you've got a B, a two, a B. So for now, when you get, so then we'll look at from C to C. These All these jump ones from C to C and C to C on a three or better. So yes and no. So Chambers is connected down here to whatever this is. I don't even know what it's called. This C starport is connected to C to E on a four or better. So we do have one little connection there. And then this E class system to C. C to E is a four or better and we get it. So there is a little lane there. My, my, my map is way busier with the star lanes than most people's. The entire sector was named by a rogue trader who had too much melange. It's a trade route, uh, says Mega Mustard. Cedar Heath says, I wonder if that's his system he's talking about. Uh, live chat, all messages visible. Trade route for the universe famous Brooks Brothers vacuum suits. Yeah, maybe Hugo Boss. Not necessarily good or bad, but make a useful buffer zone for the multi system polities or agreed upon as demilitarized. Won't matter much of a system is in 0206. Which one are we looking at here? O two, yeah, down down here, yeah, and this may be the little buffer zone, uh, but again, it depends, right? Like if this is a planet with billions of people, they may be um, whatever we wind up naming that. They may be extremely xenophobic and like nobody is welcome here. I don't know. Maybe it's even like a low tech planet that nobody even nobody wants to go around. But that's so. That's I'm really. Does this look right to you guys? Most of the systems, I, most of the games, the subsectors I see don't have nearly as many connections as I do. I'm starting to wonder if I did that wrong. I mean, technically, I, and, and the one rule I have here is I try not to cross star lanes. So I'm not even going to check if B, technically you could have a star lane from B to B. One, let's see, one, two, three on a four or better I guess we could check that one from Intania to Stagbrew. That might be useful for, for shipping later on. So let's check that. We need a four or better. And we got it. So we still have yet another star lane that, that bypasses chambers and slips right through there. So it bypasses go away too. But, but there you go. That's, that's the, 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 the space lanes. Very busy. Very interesting. And we can turn the page on that, and we can take a look at the two systems. So the first one, actually, I'm going to leave that page up. But I don't want to tear it. 
I, I think it was a, an interesting discussion over on Rolling Bones tonight because it was really kind of a game design system. Let's do let's do it in alphabetical order. We're gonna do Cal Caldetus first. This is the B class starport. So see, I I, already, I came prepared, baby. I did some homework. B class. I'm gonna roll a whole bunch of dice, and we're gonna use the same system we did last time, where the I've got four different pairs of dice. The red dice will be the size, the white dice will be the atmo, the blue dice will be the hydrographics, and the black dice will be how many peeps are calling the place home. So with a 10, we have a nice 8,000 square, uh, 8,000 diameter. Let me put them, I should be rolling these over here. I hope I don't mess them up. There we go. So we got 8,000 miles across. She's a beefy one. She's an Earth-sized planet. It's going to be interesting to see if I memorize these. Then, with white, we've got our atmosphere, which is non-existent. Well, wait a minute. It's actually going to be 4, minus 7, plus 8. So that becomes a plus 1. And it's not too bad, actually. It's a thin atmo. Okay, I stand corrected. It's kind of hard to hit the, the, the middle in there, but, but we did it. True or a little trade haven, Singapore analog city. Yeah, that could be. Lots of people, nice little uh, trade thing. Um, sitting in between the trade zones and taking advantage of the shipping. The pheasant from the Legend of Galactic Heroes. Uh, Dundermoose has got a new space lane and no Vogon fleet necessary. Yep, nice little bypass. It's like a map of New Jersey with all the exits, says Cedar Heath. This is still the best system for rolling planets from any RPG. I yeah, I I we're gonna talk about planetary design and how you can have a massive planet with a very small population. Winds of Gath. Go read it. It's like 110 pages. I read it on a flight in the amount of time it would have taken me to watch a movie. And it was so much more interesting. Uh, thin atmosphere is breathable. Let's talk about that. The thin atmosphere are breathable without assistance. You don't even need a mask for this one. Distinct lack of quality of poetry. So we got a thin atmosphere, and then what's next? The blue dye is the water, and we once again are using the uh, 81 version, classic traveler for this. Which is better? I think I think that might work a little better. I think if the, the other day we did we zoom in and did that help? With the stupid auto zoom, we can go right in on the paper so you can see everything I'm writing down. Let's try that. Uh, thin Atmo. The we've got uh, a hydro of six minus seven is negative one. Adding the atmosphere, so we're at eight five. I'm just glad we don't have to look at another planet with a taint. Oh, I, maybe I can even oh, look at that. See, there we go. Uh, so 8, 5, and then it's the blue dice minus 2 gives us a 40% hydro. Not bad. Not bad. Maybe a little on the dry side. Maybe some, some big mountain ranges with big rain shadows. Maybe lots of deserts. And then population is going to be, we got a big one, it looks like. 2d6 minus 2 is 7. We've got tens of millions. I think that might have been a 10 and I messed it up. But I don't care because I've got 10... How many tens of millions? I've got 30 million people on this planet. That ain't bad. 30 million. So 8, 5, 4, 7. This is going to be a nice stop. I think Caldetus... I think... I think old Caldetus is going on the regular route. And I still have to roll for law. Let's do black for the government and blue for the for the law. Black for the ooh, we haven't had one of these yet. Oh, this is good stuff. Box cars on the government. This is going to be twelve minus seven plus seven. It's a straight up twelve. That's going to be a charismatic oligarchy. Charismatic oligarchy. So I don't think this is going to be part of the greater Dagonian co-prosperity. The distribution of the population sizes is logarithmic. Yeah, but they do tend to cluster down. But again, it's you're you're looking at this on a 
on a 2d6 at least the now the population is an easy one because it is simply minus two so your your typical population right your your most common result is going to be a seven on the dice which means your most planets are going to have hundreds of thousands of people with with an even number of of you know, tens and millions of, of, so between the four, five, and six where we cluster, if you look at that, your average of those three is still going to be about a million. So I come to think of it, yeah, I, yeah, it, but it is, it does get exponentially larger. I think it's a little funny. I still think it's hilarious that he told us, oh, population is, is it straight two D6? Yeah. And then uh, there's no way to get bigger than tens of billions. Like, you're not going to get up to 100 billion. Lots of planets have the population of Kenosha, Wisconsin. Kenosha, home of the Society for the Preservation and Encouragement of Barbershop Quartet Singing in America. God bless... Oh, of course, they renamed themselves the Barbershop Harmony Society because that's really boring and and, and tedious. But they put a bunch of... Um, of fellas who are rather light in the loafers in charge, and they made it dumb, as they usually do. So that is a Class B government, and then we have a law of eight. Inud, home of the ferocious wand swarms. I have no idea what you're talking about. But I do know that law level is going to be at minus seven plus the government, which gives us a result of 13... And the charismatic oligarchy, everything is illegal. The, the law is actually going to be... So that was a 8 plus 5. It's going to be a B for the law, which technically is... Well, wait, wait a second here. A B for the law. Yeah, I don't understand what that means. So everything is illegal. No weapons. And, and I do think it's it's rather interesting that the law keys in on weapons. It's almost like the more bans you have on weapons, the more... I can't believe there's not a Traveler player in here that can correct John's population roll. What, what's wrong with my population roll, Jeffro? I rolled a, I rolled a 12... I'm going to double check. The digit indicating population is the exponent of 10. Thus, a population digit of 6 is a million people. Population is generated with a two dice throw. No, I rolled a 7. Tens of millions. It's right here in the table, baby. No, Oh, wait. Did I roll a 7 and wound up with a 9? Or did I roll a 9? Did I roll a 9 and it should have been 7s? Or did I roll a 7 and it should be 5s? Chat? I'm, I'm, I'm looking at you, chat. How about finger guns? How did you get the 3? I don't play Traveler. I watch him play Traveler. Uh, I'll, I'll scroll back up. I second needed. Do what? The distribution of the population is logarithmic. Name the planet Enid. What can I not do, Jeffro? Spell it out for me. I wonder if this could be compatible with West End's D6. And this is very import, important. Uh, Jeff Fro says, I was disappointed to hear that the first edition of Traveler is the correct one to be playing and not the stupid reprint that I have. Uh, how did I get the three? Oh, okay. Gotcha. So here's here's where we... Let, let, me, let me slide back out and we'll talk about how I do full population. And, and I'm going to quote you chapter and verse because, you know, we, we think these things matter. Uh, when you get to the procedure for world creation is intended to provide a wide variety of features for worlds. For example, a population digit of six indicates a population of a million. It could be construed to actually cover a range from slightly more than the next lowest to slightly less than the next highest. In other words... These guidelines, like, you don't have, for water, I have 40%. I don't have exactly 40%. I have somewhere between 30 and 50%. And likewise, with population, I the, the way the rules are written, you have somewhere, because I rolled a 7, you have somewhere between a million and a 100 million population. Now, what I do to make that, make that work is, 
whenever I have this digit, I then roll a D6 to find out how many of these units I have. On a population one world, I will have somewhere, and I just, to, to keep it consistent that they have one simple rule, I just roll a D6. So for me, I always go from this up, which means at, at level zero, I have between, it says no inhabitants. All right, well, I'll buy that one. I might roll a D6 to find out that we have between one and six. A lone listening post, for example. When I get to the one, I roll a D10 and I have from 10 to 60. In this case, because I had seven, I have between 10 and 60 million people. In this case, I rolled a three. So my total planetary population is 30 million. And again, this is not an official census. This could go up or down by as many as a half a million people based on just general, like generational trends. I'm not going to worry about that because what really matters is, and ultimately this extra 20 million people that I applied doesn't make a difference mechanically un un when we get to the real issue, which is, hey, if I'm hauling cargo, I'm still going to have a population seven world, right? I'm still going to be rolling seven dice to find out how many cargo shipments I've got and how many tons are available and how I can, can calculate these. But, you know, this is really just more for flavor. And, and it, 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 but it does wind up giving you a little bit of distinction. If I've got two planets with a population of seven and one of them is 10 million and one of them is 60 million, I now have some relative proportion of which one is larger than the other. It's the difference between the New York City metro area and, say, the Oklahoma City metro area. Although I think that's probably closer to 2 million. But I, th I think you get my point. So we've generated all of our important stats for Calditas. And we've established that it's outside the sphere of the Targ Martians. Um, we can look at Cyric. You know, I was looking at this, and let's pause for a moment. We'll come back around to Semit. I was looking at Cyric, and if I bring up that page, so Cyric is 0807. So we come over here to 08. There's Corvinus and Cyric. And this is where I realized, oh, you know what? This only has, this is a water world. Now, it, it has no government. So why did I say earlier it's captive? Because I forgot. But this is a water planet, and we've already determined that Hank Hillsong and the Dagonians are a water cult. So the fact that we've got this water planet right next door with 400 population, it's a huge, it's got a dense atmosphere. It must be home to a sacred site, and those 400 people are part of a monastery that you have some shipping back and forth for pilgrims going to visit the sacred shrine of, and if we look at I, I guess the other thing we could do is maybe we put Bill Dotrieve in charge. We're going with a Hank Hill theme for this whole thing. So, so may, maybe old, maybe old Bill Dotrieve. He was in the Navy, wasn't he? So that would make sense to put the Navy man on the water planet. But we can talk more about that later. In the mean, uh, in the meantime, we want to uh, flesh this out. Uh, what do we got here? You rolled a D six to get the three. Yes, Jeffro, that's what I did. Uh, sigh, you hear not listen. Let's see. Not a logarithmic result. Your campaign is wrong. Don't care. Too bad. So sad. John's not going to be taxing those folks. Jeffrey, how does he generate a logarithmic result? Well, um, I, how do you rule a logarithmic result with a D6? You could, well, 2D6 minus 2 would give you anywhere from 0 to 10. Oh, look, now it's 10. My concern there is that by multiplying that number by one point, but basically by 10. So this result, here we go, let's do this. So here's our common result. If you really wanted to be truly logarithmic, then um, this result would be a 5, and you'd multiply it by 1.5. So that, that 10 million would become 15, whereas this would be multiplying it by 1.0. It, it would be doubling it. Right. So, but, but then you would still have, you would still have numbers clustering. I, I don't know how you would do it. You would still have, if you did it the way I suggested, you would still have like a cluster down here at the two, at the doubling in size, and then a, and then a quantum leap before you get to that times 10. So I'm, I'm not sure. Yeah. Like my population's 
have this weird thing where they go one, two, three, four, five, six, and then they skip up to the next one. Like there's no populations of 70, 80, 90 million. You get right to 100. Um, and it is linear within that, that step of the logarithmic scale. But like I said, I, I don't care. I'm with operating within the rules and uh, as provided by Mark. If you have a problem with it, take it up with Mark. Uh, here we go. So we got to roll four. We'll zoom in again because I like that. Oh, Bill Dotrieve was army. Ah, nuts. Okay. I guess that makes sense. Yeah, because he was still cutting hair at the at the at the army base, wasn't he? Zoom in. There we go. Whoa, 2D6 plus a chart fixes all your problems. Jeffro, yeah, hit me up with a hit me up with a, an alternative dice rolling method. Tuesday is math day. Man, says Dunder Moose, I need to buy a pocket protector after the back and forth with Jeffro. Jeffro, you guys, you're acting like those guys who try to work on imperial economics and never actually play the game. Oh, boo. Be nice, guys. We're, we're all among friends here. Um, and I'd be interested to see what kind of mechanic you could come up with to keep it, keep it, keep it on the log scale. Um, this is not a game for people that are afraid of a little bit of math. What's my order here? I believe my white was, the red was the size. That was a two. So we got a size five. We got a white is the atmosphere. So we'll be at minus two to the white. So five, five. We have another th thin atmosphere. 5,000 miles across. Thin atmo. I'm, I'm okay with that. Blue is a 7, which is minus 7 plus the Atmo. That becomes a 50% water. I'm thinking this will be part of the Hillsongians. But then our population, once again, is in the hundreds. Yes, but I must encourage the kayfabe. Iron sharpens iron. Uh, so we've only got... I'm, I'm doing it again. Close your eyes, Jeffro. Look away. Just, just look away. Okay, this is happening. I got a two, so there's hundreds of people. There's only 100 people on this planet. So again, I think we may be in a situation where Semit with the C is part of the... That's only a jump one away from, from Tardmart, so that may be the case. Roll in the black and white. Black is government. White is law. The government is going to be a... Negative one plus the population of one makes the law no laws. Yeah, so we got no government. That's no government. But the law is going to be... Oh, wait, 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 hold on, hold on. Did I do that right? It's minus seven plus the population, so we're at minus two altogether. That becomes a four. No, I did that wrong. Six. Minus seven is negative one. Plus the population of one. Oh, is zero. Yeah, yeah, it's going to be zero. No government. Imagine there's no government. It's easy if you try. And then the law is going to be negative seven plus zero. So the law, oddly enough, there is a, a, an, a gentleman's agreement among the hundred people that are in the population there. And that gentleman's agreement is that we have law two, so just no no portable weapons. Uh, law equals two, no energy beams, no blasters, no blasters. So that's a five five. That is a five five five. Boy, it's like a phone number on the on the TVs, isn't it? Five 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 one zero two, and then oh, I forgot to do tech level for. Caldetus. Let's finish tech level here, and then we'll circle back around to Caldetus. What do we got here? We got ourselves... Uh, how, how can I show both of these? There we go. So for the starport of B, we start off at... I got to roll a D6. We start off at 2. We go up to 6. Size doesn't matter. Atmosphere doesn't matter. Hydrosphere doesn't matter. Population of one gives us a seven, and then our government of Denada gives us a tech level of 
eight. Which, to remind you, is roughly... I should write the decades down on this. Air Raft and Fusion. We are into the 21st century. What about Caldetus? And then once we're done with this, we are going to... For the time and money it takes to maintain a girlfriend, you can have a really decent 40k habit. Yeah, ain't that, that the truth? Um, I need to find a way to trick my viewers into buying my 40k stuff. And, and maybe then I'll do it. Uh, so what do we get here? We got tech level 8. And then over here, no weapons. So BB. So Caldetus. Did I spell that right? I did. He's going to have a tech level. Oh, no I, no, I screwed that up. They have a starport of C. That means the tech level goes down by 2. Uh, Summit has a tech level of 6. They get demoted. That makes sense. I think we have another shrine world. They have auto rifles. They have TVs, but that's it. So televangelist. This may be the the TV center of the of the. Uh, maybe this is uh, where Pastor Redcorn lives. Uh, maybe he's a native of this particular world, and we can finish off the polity because we've made that decision. So Summit is in. You're in the club, guys. And then we'll just finish off our nice red polity. So we have a really big planet surrounded by a bunch of smaller planets. Like, this one is billions of people with a couple of smaller ones. Hot Take Fuda is the lowest form of anime. How dare you, Penfold? How dare... If I knew anything about anime, I would be outraged. I would be scandalized if I cared. So, Caldetus, let's find out how big they are. This time, we start with a D6 roll. Oh, they're gonna be huge, baby. They, they know. They know. These are gonna be those high tech rednecks. So we get a five plus four gives us a nine, and then it's gonna be size eight. Uh, atmosphere nothing. Hydro nothing. Population of B gives us nothing. So we're at eight, and then a government of B. So it's just tech level eight. All right, no problem. Tech level eight. Now, let's go ahead and talk about something something here, okay? I want to talk to you guys about high passage and low passage. And to give you uh and, and this is this is where um I, I Jeffro and Brian Renninger. Jeffro says, okay, it's an exponential curve. The population of the planet is 10 to the 7 by default. If you use the D6 to adjust and get a 3, the population is now 10 to the 7 plus 2 sixths. Ooh, we are getting deep into... Hey, look, man. Vancean magic is indistinguishable from mathematics and vice versa. This is where the magic happens. Okay, let's talk about the Winds of Gath. The Winds of Gath, there's a couple of things we want to, that, that you need to understand about the way this book works. It is a near hard science fiction. Imagine if sci hard science fiction writers weren't a bunch of dorks that spent all their time huffing their own farts. And you get the Winds of Gath, because the science serves the story. And then, when the when the, the science gets in the way of the story, we just chuck it right out the window. The planet of Gath is a very interesting one, because it's really big. And it is tidally locked with the sun, which is over here. Which means this part of the planet is ridiculously hot. And this part of the planet is really cold. So here, just to give you something to look at. See how the thermometer is down there? And see how the thermometer is up here? Whoa, it's bursting because it's really hot. There is a strip of land, very narrow, right here. Okay? That's where the people live and not many of them. Because in order to keep this planet... Um, oh, it's got a breathable atmosphere, by the way. But... All of the hot air is constantly going up, and then it's coming back down over here. So you get these massive winds. They are, of course, somewhat seasonal. Yeah, it's a thermometer, right? It's got the little... It's not digital is the problem, right? So you see... Get your mind out of the gutter, Dart Mart. I, it, this is... Do, do, I, what, what, okay, fine. You know, I, I'm trying to be serious here, guys. Okay, why does this drive the narrative? Because it turns out seasonally there is a, a set of mountains where when the winds come sweeping off the, the ocean, 
it makes a sound that is fantastic. In fact, it, and I don't want to spoil it for you, but there's a reason people come from miles around, and by miles around, I mean, um, I mean light miles around. Our hero doesn't want to be here because he winds up getting marooned on this planet. As you can imagine, a planet like this has very little industry. The only industry that you have is the tourism. People land at the spaceport, and then there's a two-day journey up to where the magic, the magic mountains are, and they sing to you, and then you have to come back down. So our hero, Dumarest of Terra, he winds up, at a uh, long story short, well, no, I'm not a long story short. I'm, I'm going to explain to you exactly why, because this all informs how Traveler works. He's traveling low, and he's asleep. All right, let me back, but we got to back up a step, because I probably should have started by talking about high and low passage. In the Dumarest of Terra books, and this is where high and low passage comes from, at least the terminology. Low passage works exactly the way it does here in Traveler. A, a cryogenic box that is largely used for livestock makes a cheap way to travel between the stars. You climb in, it gets really cold, and then you get pulled out of the box. When you travel medium, you have to live through every day of the journey. And these are long journeys. They can take a couple of months. But there's this alternative, traveling high. Of course, in Traveler, we've all seen the traveling high just means you get a private room. It's pretty swanky. You know, room service, the whole shebang. If you travel medium, you get a private room and the food's not as good. But in the case of Dumarest of Terra, this is where the hard science fiction comes back in. Your starship is blasting across the ether through the void. And I don't want to have to experience all of that crawling across the universe. So the ship's doctor, and this is why it's important that every ship has a doctor. One, so he can revive the guys coming out of low passage. But two, he injects all of the high passengers with a drug called quick time. And quick time speeds up your metabolism by 40 times. And it allows you to experience 40 seconds of real time in one second of subjective time. Expand that. For every subjective day that you live, 40 days pass in the real world. For every week that you travel, 40 weeks travel. So you can experience a six-week journey in a single day. That creates some very interesting things going on. If I'm traveling low because I'm the pilot of the ship, I'm the captain, I'm the, the, the engineer who has to be aware of what's going on, I will be surrounded by statues, people that are moving very slowly. And you have to be very careful with them because you're moving 40 times faster than they are. Or, I'm sorry, did I get that right? No, they're, they're zipping around. I got that backwards. They're flying around in quick time because, you know, it, 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 everything is relative here. So the time it would take you to move one foot, they move 40 feet. So what happens is, well, yeah, that Cyric raises a good point. We're traveling high. It turns out we're high on drugs, not like high on the hog or, or high society. We're high on quick time and we're, we're zipping around. So, this, so then EC Tub says, well, what does that mean? If I grab this drink... Oh, well, okay, first of all, let's, let's think about what that means from a practical standpoint. If one day of my time causes six weeks to pass and I eat three meals in that day, I starve to death by like three o'clock in the afternoon because my body is still burning calories at the same rate it always did. It's just that, you know, I'm, I'm moving at a different rate. So, yeah. Yeah, you know, the, the people around me are, are, are like statues. Be, so I have to be careful not to touch them because if I punch somebody while I'm on quick time, that's going to be 40 times the force. And again, that's exponential. My hand will shatter if I punch somebody who's at regular time and I'm at fast time. But going back to food, you have to have a special diet. 
And that special diet is, it's described, I can't remember what it's called, but it's like a special blend of glucose and proteins and all of this stuff. And what happens is you're getting like 40 times the calories so that when I, when I drink a couple of cups of this broth, I'm getting 40 times the calories. And if I have three meals a day, it's the same as getting 40 meals because 40 days of real time have passed in my one day of subjective time. But let's think about it even further. I've got my broth that I pour from the spigot, and the stuff takes a long time to fill, so I have to have it ready. But now, in the time it took the cup to fill, like maybe it only takes five seconds. All right, well, that's 200 seconds. Well, that's three or four, that's like three or four minutes, right? And now I take 10 seconds to take a sip of it. Well, that's actually 400 seconds. That took five minutes. This drink is going to be ice cold by the time I take my second sip. So to account for that, our... Our, our hard science fiction author says the cups that you're drinking, by the way, we're drinking a, a Sun Joy from everybody's favorite, Chick-fil-A. No burps today, baby. Each cup has comes with a little heating element down at the bottom that keeps the beverage inside at a constant temperature. And this becomes a very important plot point in a number of the Dumarest of Terra books. Later on in the book, our hero uses quick time to save the space princess, which is where we have to come back to this planet. So Dumarest is, is poor, and he needs to get moving, and so he climbs into a box and, and falls asleep. He says to the guy that's running the ship, hey, where are you going? And the guy says, I'm going to planet X. And Dumeres says, good, there's work on Planet X. I'm going to go there. He's basically like, uh, you know, hot, riding the rails. He's like a hobo. He goes from town to town. He has adventures. And in each book, he generally goes to a planet like Gath, has his adventure, and then earns passage off the planet. Okay, so why am I telling you that? Because it's a very interesting mishmash of the kinds of things that you see in Traveler. He wakes up three days out. And is like, hey, Doc, what are you doing? You know, you, you're, you're supposed to wake me up when I get important. The Doc says, look, I'm new at the job. I'm lonely. I need somebody to talk to. Don't worry. I'm going to nurse you back up to health. He gives him a whole bunch of that, that, that protein shake to fatten him up. Because if you've just come out of a cryo box, you're usually weak. You're cold. You're starving. And so the doctor has pity on him and makes him nice, fat, and healthy. Well, then the Doc spills the beans. Yeah, we're actually going to gath. And as you might imagine, Gath has no industry. So anybody that finds up, wakes up on Gath, if they don't have the 10,000 credits to buy high passage to the next town out, they're stuck here and they're going to starve because the whole world, for reasons that I won't spoil, has no real source of protein. There's no, the only income that you can have is serving as a human mule for all of the rich people that came to hear the songs of the mountains as, as the winds of Gath blow through. This becomes important in the book because the reason the ship didn't go to planet X is that there was a, there's a planet with a space queen who has to protect the space princess whose life is in danger. And so she does that trick where she says, it's time to go on vacation. She comes over to the planet Gath. And she drags the princess along where the number of potential assassins shrinks from everyone on the planet, the, the huge populated planet, to everyone on Gath, which only has a few hundred people. Right? So now it's much easier to protect this princess for the few weeks until the political situation settles down. The queen can say, oh, well, this princess is going to be my heir because the queen has to name an heir. There, there's a lot of political intrigue. But then you get into a situation where a, one of the other tourists down here has a plan for, for, for doing stuff. And again, I'm not going to spoil the book, but you have a situation, if you've ever seen the live action version of The King and I, where the King of Siam realizes that he is at grave risk of being subject to a coup, he packs up all 40 of his children and all 30 of his wives. Oh, gross. Can you imagine having to deal with that many women? Ugh. Ugh. I have a hard enough time with the one I got. Imagine 29 others. But they go off to see a white elephant that doesn't exist. The planet Gath is the white elephant that serves the excuse to get the princess out of the way. And oh, look, now our hobo 
has an opportunity to provide a service and help protect. In fact, early on, he winds up foiling an assassination attempt on the princess and out of, well, kind of out of gratitude, she says, hey, I will buy your passage off of this dead end planet. You don't have to worry about living as a pack mule. You don't have to worry about, um, you don't have to worry about starving to death here with the rest of the bums. And of, of course, there are a whole lot of other aspects of the book. There is a kind of a psychic empire and kind of a holy empire that operate across the galaxy. And it's, it's really interesting the way these, they're, they're I, I, I don't want to spoil too much, but they're basically like psychic cyborgs. They're, they're humans who really want to be robots. So they cosplay as robots to the point that they have all of their like hormonal stuff balanced, but they have psychic abilities to, you know, um, communicate across the distances. It's really an interesting bit of world building that creates a lot of potential for strife. And, um, and, and again, I just, I can't recommend grab any of the Doom or Rest of Tarot books if you ever have an interest in playing Traveler, because any one of them, you'll start to see the influences on the game or vice versa. So that's kind of my little lecture and, and quick review of the Winds of Gath. Um, going back to quick time, there, there's another kind of aspect of it that let's suppose you can run it at six miles an hour, that's 10 minute miles. If you're running six miles an hour, if I do that while I'm on quick time, I'm running at 240 miles an hour. If I stumble at that speed, I'm going to be a red smear on the pavement. So if I'm on a planet where there's like uneven surfaces and birds and critters flying around, I got to be really careful about how I move. In fact, if I move too fast, if I'm moving at like, what, 120 miles an hour, my clothes are going to shred around me. This is why you only really ever want to use quick time on, uh, within the safe confines of a starship. And when you're on quick time, you still have to be careful because if you drop something, then, you know, it's going to shatter and you don't want to catch it because you're going to be moving way too fast. And again, you wind up busting your hand. Uh, the... The you know wh when you're on quick time you're gonna want to throw rocks at people because you'll be able to hurl them at forty times normal speed. If you can only throw a fifty mile an hour fastball, well, great. Now you're throwing a four hundred mile an hour fastball. You're gonna take somebody's head off with that, and you're gonna be able to throw two of those before anybody even knows what's going on. Again, you have to be very careful though because your metabolism is moving. If you're you know you better make sure you are well fed because if you spend an hour on quick time, you just went three days without eating. So make sure that you're well fed. And that plays into one of the things that, that I think some people miss. When you're traveling low in Traveler, a low passage, let, let's look that up real quick. Let's quote chapter and verse. Uh, the traveling low, how do we move between the stars? Working passage, so high passage, middle passage. Uh, they have comfort, middle passage. Uh, they fill their staterooms on standby. Baggage allowance of 100 kilograms, so that's important. Transportation while in cold sleep is possible at relatively low cost to the starship. The low passage involves some intrinsic dangers. He runs risk of not surviving. Throw a five up for each passenger when he is revived after the ship has landed. Attending a medic or expertise of a tour better gives you a plus one. Low passenger with an endurance of six or less, minus one. Failure to achieve the throw results in death for the passenger. And even here, we see the influences of EC Tub. Because one of the reasons that the guys are stranded on Gath is that they haven't had a proper meal in a week or so. Their endurance is going to be at zero, and they're only going to be surviving that on a you know on on a two or a three they're gonna die on a two three or four this gives them that one in six chance and ec tub repeatedly says i ain't traveling low i have a one in six chance of dying but other characters point out no 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 if you're well fed if you take care of yourself and you're healthy and you have a an effective medic attending you this five up to survive if you have a medical expertise two or better, then that becomes a four up. 
you, you're you're going to be you're doing much better, right? Now again, it only costs a thousand credits, so that's something. And of course, this whole concept of I need to to get a score of ten thousand credits, and I don't care what I have to do to get it. That drives the conflict in a lot of these books. The, the, Dumares does not want to risk his life. Fortunately, he is crazy fast and good with a knife. So he routinely says, look, if I stay on this planet, I'm going to die. So I'm going to have to climb into the arena and bet my life savings that I can kill the other guy before he kills me. And if I, you know, if I don't do this, I'm going to die on this planet. So at least fighting the guy gives me a literal fighting chance. Uh... So now Jeffro has now worked out the math, which is good because I don't do that live. Do not ever pop multiply the population result by a D10. This is the worst type of wrong. Yeah, so his crappy population multiplier is roll a D6. And on a 1, it's just the normal result. On a 2, it's 1.5. On a 3, it's 2.2. 4, it's 3.2. 5, 4.6. And 6, it's 6.8. Yes, hashtag thank you, Jeffro. Um... Let's see. Do not ever multiply population results by a D10. Yeah, no, that just that just winds up taking you up to the next to the next uh, category, right? Uh, they're all ninety nine cents on Kindle, by the way. That's how I bought a Mega Buster. I just went through and ding, ding. in fact that that kind of Mega Buster you can get. I think it's the first five or maybe six novels in the in the Doom Arrest of Terra series for a dollar. They're bundled up. You know, the first six are practically free. Then you got to pay for the rest. Uh, they're also very good and very short. Yeah, Flandry is another good one. Van Reen. I think Flandry is the Paul Anderson, correct me if I'm wrong, where he's the spy. And again, he lands on a planet. And one of them, he landed on a planet of space mongols where it was always snowy. And he had them drive their, their like tractors and make a series of signs that could be read from outer space saying, help me. Like that was how they communicated. It was pretty fun. Uh, if I'm traveling, don't let John roll my dice. Yeah, there's a reason I haven't traveled low at all. I haven't read The Demon Princes. This is Dunder Moose uh, offers that recommendation for which I am grateful. But cannot speak to with any authority of my own. I'm out of stuff to talk about. We're going to do another one of these here uh, here pretty soon. we got three more planets we got to develop and uh, look for some connections. Looking at you, chat. Anything else? Oh, yeah, I should probably write down. i tell you what we're going to do. Tell you what we're going to do before we close out. I have two more systems. Let's see if I can zoom in. There we go. There we are. C and E. There we are. Um, let's see. Do, 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 do. Hey, did you know? you know what I found out the other day? I was listening to another uh, channel. They were talking about Thundar the Barbarian. And um, did you know Chuck Dixon? Chuck Dixon wrote for Thundar the Barbarian. This world is an amazing place. I love that. Hey, thanks for coming aboard, uh, Sex Edmund Thunder. Uh, should, should we name one of these? We're going to name one of these after you. We'll call this... Should we call it Thunder Sex? I don't think so. I'm already skating a fine line by naming one of my systems Tardmart. Uh, so we're just going to call it the Thunder System, all right? We could call it Thunder Rift. That'd be good, right? Uh, it's implied Dumarest has been traveling for centuries in the books. Yes, that is very true. By the time he makes it, oh, spoiler alert, by the time he does make it back to Terra, the place is unrecognizable because he has been traveling low for so long and high. Um, Jeffro, do you not age when traveling low? I believe that is the case. If your quick time lasts more than eight hours, you should see a doctor. Yeah, I've heard that. That's what it says in all the hyperspace commercials. Um, I that's correct. You, you're when you're traveling low, you're actually in suspended animation, and um, so you don't age. I don't know if you age on quick time. I don't think you do, because as as other commenters have pointed out in the Doom Arrest of Terra books, uh, he leaves Terra at a very young age. He's only like ten years old, and he stows away on a ship, and the captain is kind hearted. And takes him along, and by the time Dumarest realizes that uh, he would like to go home, he's been traveling for hundreds of years, 
and he has no idea where it is, and all of the records are deleted, and it's kind of a major thread through the whole thing, that one of the reasons he keeps traveling is every planet he goes to, he asks around if anybody's heard of Terra, and it's a running gag that everybody goes, wait, Dirt? There's lots of planets named Dirt, and he's like, no, Terra, the, like, home of people, and, and everybody's like, Bro, you think people all came from one single planet? Do you know how many people there are in the galaxy? There's like billions of them. And you think we all came from one planet? <whistles> what are you, some kind of, you know, they treat him like a flat earther when he talks like that. Uh, Forgotten Ruin is Kino. Carl Gustav, don't care. I read the first two. I thought it started getting a little bit same, same. But I would definitely recommend everybody take a look at it. Name the E1 Medicine Hat. Why Medicine Hat? I'm gonna name one of these the the Johnson. Oh no, I'm not gonna name it. I have a, I have a John. Uh, I don't know if you're aware of this or not. Let me let me find my ship's roster. Jeffro answers to Captain Deuce. Uh, where is it? We have yes. Here we go. So this is the roster of the the Money Crater, and you'll notice that our chief steward is named John Jeffroson. And we decided that he's a steward too. And then, and then he also has a skill here that's called swing dance. This is how he keeps the people occupied. He, he Swing dance uh, swing dance one. That could be a major plot point. So he helps keep the, the passengers satisfied by teaching them how to um, how to dance the, the, the herky jerk. What, what, what? I don't know. To dance the, uh, not, not the Charleston. I don't know what the swing moves are. I'm not a swing dancer. Uh, yeah, so we, you're already in there. I'm not naming it after you, Jeffro. Uh, the, the, the jitter bug. There you go. How to dance the, the, the jitter space bug. Because you got to make it spacey, right? So it's the jitter space bug. Uh, who else have I not named anything after? Um, R dubs. This one is called R dubs. R dub. So we got R dub and we got thunder. I haven't already named anything after you, have I, R dubs? Yeah, I think that's fair. R dubs is a good guy. Go follow him on Twitter. We're done. We're going to finish these off later. But I do. Oh, one thing I'll notice look at this. We now have a B class starport, a B class, B class, B. I knew there was something I was missing. We've got. I'll actually zoom out. Okay. B class at Stagbrew. B class at Caldetus, Fraley, Cyric, Corvinus. We I needed to figure out what the the remember that the money crater is a subsidized freighter. And he bops around this side of the universe. And I think we have our I think we know what our route is going to be now. Corvinus to Tobor to Cyric. And here's the starports. So we this is our danger zone. CC B C B. And now we know what the population of Caldetus is. So we have seven. That's pretty good. A huge. Oh, we got to hit Cyric for the fuel up and a little bit of mail and a little bit of two. Then we can go to a big class A population. And then we bop over to Caldetus. And as we said, Caldetus is the best of all possible worlds. Because not only can you get fuel there, but it's, a pop it's another one of those population seven worlds. That is a must stop. Okay, so that's where we're at. Now we hit, remember that we hit Tardmart and then we jump back to Cyric and we have a class three star vessel. So the question is, where do we go from there? Well, this time we kind of went backwards. We went, we went Tobor, Tardmart, Cyric. And maybe this is where, did we already, I'm gonna have to go back and do my, watch that episode again. I think we said, let's hold off. I think we're holding off on Tardmart. Oh, no, I know what it is. We got to go to Cyric because that's our contract. We have to drop off the mail. And then maybe we have to go back to Tardmart. That puts us two weeks off schedule, but at least we, we fulfill our contract. Fulfill our route, right? So normally, I think what you would want to do is hit... So we hit Tobor. And then we tried to get to Cyric. We, this would be our normal route. Corvinus, Tobor, Cyric. So we refuel. All right, now we go to Tardmart. And then we go to... Uh, so Tobor, Cyric, Tardmart. Then we go to Caldetus. 
Population 7, refuel with a good juice. And then the question is, where do we go from there? Since Semit is such a tiny little podunk, I think you jump back to Tardmart, and I think we just work our way back. We go C, although, you know, with a, with a jump 3, we can go anywhere we want. The wind, the space wind feels good on our chest. With a jump three, we can go anywhere in this area. Maybe in Othna. We can go to Anothna and then back to Syric. And then from Syric, we can jump over to back to Tobor. Maybe from Syric, we go to Herndon. But this is where things get, get hinky, right? Because we got to go back to Tobor. Once we get back to Corvinus, we go back to Tobor. So I think from Cyric, we got to go Corvinus, Tobor, and we're just not going to be hitting the Mushroom Kingdom at all. As we work our way back down from Calditus, I think that's the best play. Maybe Yanothna? Do you guys remember how populated Yanothna was? Uh, Yanothna had a population of... It's just two... Heck with that. We ain't, we ain't dropping there. Fraley has a population of four. So that might be a viable stop. We go Calditus, Fraley, Syaric. Because that way we're hitting BBB. And we get to pick up one extra planet on the route. And we could use let, allow like a, a, a local hauler. So these are the kind of things that you do. Once you have an, a, a better, clearer picture of what where the spaceports are, and you're actually running, whether that's a, a subsidized freighter like we are with the money crater, or a, a free trader Beowulf, that's where you really start to look and start planning out your, your routes. But for now, we're going to close the books on this live stream. Thanks for coming along. It's getting a little late for you East Coasters. Anybody have any other... Uh... Other, other points, uh, it's the, are you interviewing that finger this week, Moose? Wait. Uh, oh, the ginger. It's the Echo Planet. Wait, what? All right, what are we talking about here in the chat? The first 10 are 99 cents. The rest are $1.99. Yeah, it's fine. After you read the first 10, you'll either have had enough. You don't need to read the rest, or you'll fall in love, and you'll just keep on going. Uh, do, 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 do. Home of the Majestic Tardvark. Yeah, if we ever do any hunting on Tardmart, we'll look up the Tard, Tardvark. Is this thing J2? Uh, our, the subsidized hauler is a, is a jump three. Um, so we have a, it is a type M 600 ton subsidized hauler. It's got jump three, power plant D. We can take 124 tons of cargo. Uh, we, we don't have a shuttle, so we lose a little bit there. And then we have a pretty sizable crew. Now, the navigator is Munderduce, but he's also the captain. He's the guy that's in charge. Our pilot is Hans Peterson. And then uh, for right now, our junior engineer is Chad Solo. So Chad's running with these guys. When we get up to this area, depending on how things shake out, remember that the, the I think well, I think it's the, the cultists don't like our boy. We, we almost got in a fight. But I'll, again, I'll have to go back and rewatch those because my notes aren't the best. Uh, here, here's the notes that I do have. Right after my, my calendar, which will take us up through September. Uh, let's see. Second interview. Yeah, I didn't write anything down. I got to go back and rewatch those and write some notes. Okay. Seriously, guys. Till next time. I'm praying for you.